Nigeria's headline inflation rate reached some 34.19% in June. Uh, you are aware the food inflation is over 40% as we speak. You're not currently in Nigeria, but I'm sure you feel the pulse of the people on social media. Many have blamed government policies on that this administration has risen for their predicament. What do you think? Well, even though I'm not in Nigeria, I've got staff in Nigeria, I pay taxes in Nigeria, so I do have some idea of what's going on in Nigeria. You have to understand that we're going through some economic reforms. If you look at history, the best predictor of the future is the history, is the past. If you look at historical data, Nigeria has her highest economic growth, highest GDP growth between 1969 and 1970. And the reason why is because we had a civil war. And because we had that civil war, people from the southeast left Lagos, Rivers, and Nigeria to the Rebel Republic of Biafra. And a lot of them were mostly responsible for importation. So importation ground to a halt between 1969 and 1970. As a result, we had to start manufacturing things in Nigeria. That's Ikeja, Oshodi, Ijora, Porta, Agbara, Axis. We began manufacturing. So in 1969, our GDP growth rate was 24.20%. Please, you can fact check me. The next year, 1970, it rose to our highest ever, 25.01%, because we were manufacturing in Nigeria. But then after the Civil War ended, and then importation began again, our economy just nosedived. And that's what this administration is trying to do. They're trying to make it more difficult for people to import into Nigeria. And if you look at the NBS, the National Bureau of Statistics, look at the data from our last quarter in record, that's the first quarter of 2024, you see that Nigeria had a trade surplus of about 6.52 trillion. Now, for those who are listening who don't understand what the trade surplus is, it means that we are now importing less than we are exporting. So we are exporting more goods and importing less goods, which is good for our economy. It's going to take a while. We're going through some taking problems. We're going through a winning stage. We're being weaned off our dependence on imported goods, and it's good. If you go back to 2017, I'll give you an example. In Kano, we had the Dangode tomato paste factory. It had to close down. Why did it close down? PWB was importing cheaper tomato paste from Europe flooded the Nigerian market. And then because imported goods were cheaper, it led to a destruction of the Dangote tomato paste factory. Now, we're going to be seeing the reverse, whereby imported goods are going to be more expensive because of the economic, the currency uh, reforms by the administration. And that is actually a good, is actually a good thing. Look, short-term pains are going to lead to long-term gains. Well, I, 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 like, I like the historical perspectives you brought to it. But let's talk about what's happening now. Peter Obi and Deli Momodu have raised concerns about this current administration's handling of the economy. Um, you don't think that um, perhaps there are issues here. Uh, you don't think it's alarming that Nigeria's GDP has declined from uh, $568 billion, for instance, in 2014 to $375 billion in 2023. And we're also seeing the country fall into the fourth largest economy in Africa, under this administration? Well, then, what you have to understand is this. If you listen to Daily Mabadu and Peter Obi, they did not give data. They, did not, they just gave assumptions. Now, you're giving some data, but that data is actually, and I'm going to come back to it, but Daily Mabadu and Peter Obi, they didn't give data. And as Deming said, in God we trust, all others must produce data. If you look at, first and foremost, Daily Mabadu is somebody that I like a lot. He's a friend of mine. But his background, he read Yoruba at the University of Ife. Now, with all due respect, I respect you, my people. My ancestors came from Ilife by way of Iwiri, which is now called Wari. So I'm not going to denigrate Yoruba culture, but I'm not sure that a person who read Yoruba and who has never worked in an economic capacity in any way, shape, or form, his you know, life has been about an Uwe and Play magazine, Ovation. I'm not sure that is the right person to be pontificated. Deli Momodo is a renowned then, journalist. I mean, uh, for... For decades, you don't think he has capacity to gather data and understand the issues as capacity they are? From, capacity from what? Because that's the thing. If you're talking about capacity from where? He, he read Yoruba. He's never run, you know, he's never worked in an economic capacity. He's run an O and magazine. What capacity is that? I mean, are you telling me that, for instance, now, if I was a DJ for 20 years, I can have capacity to pontificate about the economy? No, I'm not sure. So if you're talking about the economy, if you look at, okay, right now, according to the International Monetary Fund, which was just five days ago, I'm sure you saw it in the headlines, Nigeria's economy is now growing at 3.1%. Our GDP is going at 3.1%. So when Daily Mamadi says that our economy has collapsed, obviously the facts do not bear up what he's saying. 
We just had a quarter whereby we had a trade surplus of 6.52 trillion. How can you say that Nigeria's economy has collapsed with a surplus of 6.52 trillion? Like I told you, I gave you historical data, which is what this administration was trying to do with the economic reforms, and which is what we in the PDP also said we were going to do. We had a problem with Muhammad Buhari because ideologically, we were very different from him. But with this man in power, Bola Tinubu, if you look at his ideology and our ideology in the People's Democratic Party, it's almost identical. We said we were going to do four things, that we were going to remove false subsidy, we were going to have devolution of powers, we were going to have a single exchange rate regime, and we were going to put student loans. All of these four things, the man has done them. He's removed false subsidy, we now have a single exchange rate, and then he has student loan, and then with the Supreme Court judgments, with saying that local government should have autonomy, we're now seeing that we're having devolution of powers. So it's going back to what I told you, unless we start producing in Nigeria, our economy is not going to grow to the extent that we want it to grow. Yeah, that is what talking talking, what talking is, about production, Mr. Omokri, that, that exactly was what um, Peter Obi was talking about. He, he criticized what, what um, I told you that Peter he criticized Obi does not have just a bit of Mr. Mercury, he criticized what he calls government's focus on consumption rather than production. How do you precisely respond to that criticism? Uh, what evidence can you point to that this government is actively promoting production and industrialization? Well, then, uh, first and foremost, let me tackle Peter Obi. Peter Obi is Nigeria's single biggest individual importer. He's Nigeria's single biggest individual importer. Please fact check me, assume I'm lying and, and fact check me. So it's hypocritical of him to talk about moving from consumption to production when he is the one feeding this consumption. Oh. And then if you see, when he was governor of Anambra, this man bought 400 SUVs for Anambra Igwe's and now he's now talking about that uh, government profligacy. What we're seeing right now with this administration, and then we have to commend them. The president has reduced his entourage, saying that, okay, only, I think, at least five people can travel with him, and then two with the vice president. You know, I mean, that is, we're seeing some reform there. And also, we've seen that with this administration, which was we're not seeing with the uh, uh, Mohamed Buhari administration, we see that local manufacturing is now increasing. So, for example, I told you that we had a 6.52 trade surplus. A lot of that, that trade surplus is in non-oil sector. It's a non-oil sector. So, already, that I mean, that is data I've just given you. This year, for the first time, the Nigerian Stock Exchange surpassed 100,000 units ASI, all share index, for the first time. What does that tell you? That means that our local manufacturer, because these are Nigerian companies, the Nigerian Stock Exchange, they are expanding. So our local companies are now producing. So it's going to take a while. This one has been in power for one year. Let's okay. give them a chance. But mm. what I'm telling you is that what he is doing is the same thing that we in the People's Democratic Party said we're going to do, and right. are the same things that Peter will be himself said he was going to do. Mr. Mockery. Yeah. Talking about production and industrialization, the conflict between Dangote Refinery and Nigerian authorities uh, comes to mind. And we're going to talk about that shortly after this break. Stay with us, everyone. Perfect. So stay with us, everyone. Mr. Mockery, thank you for staying the course on the program. The conflict between um, Dangote Refinery and Nigerian authorities um, is exactly what many of the critics of this government have started talking about. Dili Momodu in his open letter to Mr. President is cautioning government against policies, according to him, that can trigger the exodus of businessmen in Nigeria. And I've seen some of the back and forth between you guys on X, but I want you to pay attention to what the AFDP president is also talking about. Akiwumi Adeshino is saying that this dispute is needless at the time that the country should be building partnerships for rapid development. Um, I want to quote him now precisely. He did say, this whole disparaging of Dangote is uncalled for. It is self-defeating, and it's very bad for Nigeria. Who will want to come and invest in a country that disparages and undermines its own largest investor? Mr. Mockery. Yeah, I'm here. I'm, I'm waiting for you. I That's wanted to get your reaction to that quickly. Okay, well, you see, Nigerians tend to be very emotional, especially Southern Nigerians. And if you look at this issue, this dispute that Dangote has with the NNPC, now let's look at the facts. I think it's wrong for anybody at all to disparage Dangote or the refinery. 
I don't think that they should have brought those things to the media, to the public sphere. I mean, these are things I, I'm, I mean, I'm very grateful that the Minister of State for Petroleum, Heineken and Lokoburi, got all of them uh, to a round table and they were talking. But then if you look at the facts, a lot of people don't realize it because we are very emotional people. People say that, oh, Nigeria must start supplying oil, or must start supplying crude oil to Dangote refineries. They don't understand how the oil sector works. You've got contracts. They call them forward contracts. So for the next probably about 18 months, Nigeria has signed contracts with various people to supply them with crude. So if you want to sell your crude now to the Dangote refinery, you've got to break those contracts. And if you break those contracts, those um, IOCs are going to take you to court and you are going to pay more than double what you are meant to pay. So from a business standpoint, if Nigeria breaks those contracts, we're going to be in big trouble and we're going to have issues paying our uh, obligations. So I can understand where NMPC is coming from. But the thing is that NMPC, they don't have a good media team to explain this in a simple way to Nigerians. You don't come out and start disparaging Dangote. Dangote has a business. Obviously, he is going to want the best for his business. But you need to word your statements carefully and explain to Nigerians that, okay, this is the situation. You know, we've got contracts with people in Europe, in Australia, and the United States. And then these contracts were signed long before the Dangote refinery came into being. If we cancel these contracts, if we break them, the country is going to be in big trouble. I don't need to explain to Nigerians like that. They're going to understand that. But to come out, guns are blazing and start attacking uh, Dangote, I don't think that's right. Well, it's important that we just um, clarify that the recent spat is actually between the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Authority as well as the management of Dangote Refinery. But there's this accusation, Mr. Mokri, um, about this government wasting too much money at a time that it's required to be absolutely frugal. The claim is that the economic policies as we know them today have been largely driven by selfish interest and a desire to maintain status quo rather than reaching out uh, to the people who need to be touched. Well, I mean, I will disagree with that. And one of the reasons why I'm going to disagree with that is that you've got to look at the data. Like I told you before, in God we trust, all others must produce data. If you look at the data, if you look at the budget that has been placed before us, you're going to see that capital expenditure is much higher than recurrent expenditure. And this is not the case with previous administrations. So, for instance, now we're seeing that work has begun on the Lagos Calabar Coastal Highway. And then now we see that in next month, the president is going to commission work to begin on the Sokoto to Badagri Coastal Highway. So we're seeing that a lot of work is being done in infrastructure. Obviously, people like Dele Mamadou and Peter Obi, because they've got ambitions in 2027, they are going to try to disparage this administration. But I'm not sure a man like Peter Obi, who was governor for eight years and did not build a single school, not the nursery, secondary, primary, or university, is the right person to be disparaging this administration. No. Uh, they, they, they have also given some examples. An example is purchasing presidential debts, building outlandish monuments. Um, I think it was um, the Liberal model who also talked about distributing cash as palliatives. You don't consider these wasting scarce resources? No, obviously not. You just saw what happened in Iran. I don't know if you're aware of what happened in Iran. Their president flew in a helicopter that wasn't properly managed. And what happened? It crashed. The last time Nigeria bought a presidential jet, the last time was under Obasanjo. Obasanjo, that's the last time. So, I mean, Obasanjo was president when in 2007. That's when he left. You know, so between that time and now, we're looking at a period of about how many years? Maybe about uh, 17 years. And then we should not get a presidential jet. No, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Yes, we want to be frugal, but we don't want to be frugal and then be careless at the same time. If we have a situation whereby our president is traveling on an old plane and then the plane crashes, what are we going to gain? Do Peter will be or Dele Mama, do they don't want the president to die? No. And then talking about giving out cash as palliative, that is really silly. Look, if you look at Brazil, where this has worked best, the Bolsa Familia is called in Brazil. It has worked best in Brazil, whereby you give cash palliatives to families, especially families headed by females, and that has helped in drastically reducing poverty. What are you going to say? So people are in poverty, and then the federal government is giving 50,000 nanograms to entrepreneurs to go and start businesses, and then you are saying that is bad? I mean, how can that be bad? 
So I disagree with them. Now, if you're talking about, okay, maybe building the vice president's mansion, with, which was, I think it was um, about 21 billion, I disagree with that. I don't like that. I'm against that. But one thing, you've got to put things into perspective. That cost did not come with this administration. Actually, that project actually started with a different administration. So people just want to be mischievous and say, oh, this administration is spending 21 billion building the vice president's mansion. No, it wasn't a project of this administration. They inherited it. We have just about two more minutes to go. I'm sure you're following uh, the call for protest on the 1st of August. The presidency is appealing to young people, uh, uh, calling their attention to what this administration is doing differently. How do you think this must be managed carefully uh, following what we saw in 2020? Okay, I'm going to give you an example now. Like, let's talk about someone like uh, Dede Mamadou. Dede Mamadou, you know, he's behind, I mean, he's supporting this, and then he's also questioning the economic management of the country, saying that the economy has collapsed and attacking the president. In Osho State, Osho has one of the worst multi-dimensional poverty in the Southwest. If you look at the last figures released by the National Bureau of Statistics, the state that has helped most in reducing multi-dimensional poverty in the Southwest is Ondo, followed by Lagos. Oshun is behind. Yet, Dele Momodu has praised the governor of Oshun State, Governor Deleke, over 50 times. Not 50 times, over 50 times. Are you trying to tell me that Governor Deleke is doing a better job economically than President Polatinibu? So how come you're writing an open letter saying that President Polatinibu has destroyed the economy, that just the economy is collapsing, and then at the same time, you are praising Governor I'm afraid we have to go there, but, but how, how does it affect the so protest? I think. Yes. Yes, sorry? I'm, yeah, going, I'm going there. Please, I'm going there. I'm going there. Allow me land, please. Keep interjecting. I'm not going to be able to uh, give my thoughts clearly. So, I mean, to me, I see some hypocrisy there. And then also, to all these people saying that, okay, that they want to protest in Lagos. If you look at Lagos, Lagos is one of those states that they don't owe salaries. Right. They've been paying above minimum wage since February. Since February, Lagos has been paying 70,000 minimum wage. Lagos has infrastructural projects going on. They've got the blue line, they've got the red line. Lagos give palliatives to non citizens, to non um, uh, people who are from Lagos but who are residents. Lagos also has free soup kitchens. Now, I mean, if you look at the Southeast, for example, the Southeast, they've got more DC at homes. We've not had a protest for that. In the Southeast, five of the states in the Southeast are not paying the regular minimum. Mr. Mockery, I think most of them are owing. I'm afraid we have I'm completely have run out of time. We have to take this conversation um, subsequently. Uh, but we have to go now, and I understand your position, and, and you have a lot to share, but we'll find t more time to discuss that subsequently. Reno Mockery, live for us in London. Thank you so much for talking to TVC News. Thank you, Nifemi. God bless you. That's our program today, everyone. You can watch it again at midnight. And I